Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of science fiction and all its over-the-top hyperbole to you, the viewer. Along for the ride is my co-host Steve, the semi-science literate stand-in and comic relief. Say hello, Steve. Hello. The classic. Today, we will be covering the ground vehicles that are not battle mechs from Battletech. The tanks, cars, hovercraft, and technicals driving around at the feet of giants, and the units that make up 80% of the actual fighting forces for most of the Inner Sphere. Before that though, if you'd like to support Science Insanity, get our content a day early, and have a hand in future video topics, check out our Patreon linked below. And if space bucks are short, like, sub, comment, and share the video around since every little bit helps. And with that, on to the video. Except not really, I lied. We have one more thing to oh, talk about my first. Oh god, he's doing it for him. No, this is important, okay? Trust me, this is great. So, just, like I said, off off screen, we we have hit a new milestone in the meteoric rise, a uh, moderate rise, of this channel's popularity. We have we have crossed <laughs> one of the most... Straight up lie to him. <laughs> we have crossed one of the most sacred and foundational requirements of being popular on YouTube and the internet. Do you know what it is, Steve? Uh, no, sir. We have received our first piece of high-quality fan art. Check it out! It's related to the topic of the day! Do you remember this? Yes. The Psy Technical, dude! Someone went out of their way, a professional artist went out of their way to put a very angry atlas on the back of a milk truck. It's great! <laughs> oh my god. That's fantastic. Oh my god, it's hilarious. There's there's two versions, like I said, or like like I posted. The first one is just like a, a very rough sketch of it. The second one is much more cleaned up line work, but like, god damn, it looks so good. The way his arms are up in the air with all the detail, the little like pulsing vein thing on the side of his head. Oh, and like the, my favorite part is instead of putting it on the back of like a shitty like Toyota truck or something, it's an actual battle tech like ar like artillery mover, the thing that drags the big guns and stuff around. Such a good piece of art, and I absolutely love it. For for some reason, on Imgur, which is the where he actually linked these images, his name is, is Jerry Bear 712, but just that's ridiculous. Instead, on ArtStation, which is the objectively superior site, he is the artist Sha Sengye. So, well, I have no idea how to say your name. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it up on screen and I'm going to like actually link to his uh, page. He is a professional video game concept artist and in his words, quickly sketched out this design. This is not a quick sketch, my guy. This is better than what 99% of everyone on Earth could probably produce if they put their minds to it. Bro, I could make that in like three minutes. It would, it would be about 700 lines fewer, but... Um... <laughs> I, I expect it's going to be like five circles and a dozen rectangles and you're going to figure out how to roughly align them to that. Probably something like that. I'll make something on MS Paint during the episode and uh, we'll showcase it at the end. Oh, it's fantastic. But yeah, I, I really like this. Thank you very much to the artist that make this, made this. Speaking genuinely as well, this is exactly the kind of stuff I have always wanted to create like a community or group of like-minded turbo nerds and people that can revel in and have fun with science fiction and seeing a silly, stupid idea that me and Steve were memeing about be made into actual art is fantastic. Thank you very much, Difficult Name Man, especially since I saw this when I was having a really shit day. You saved my afternoon. And now we can finally get onto the actual video after... Oh, five minutes? Let's talk about Battletech's ground vehicles, the fodder of every mech warrior video game and the butt of almost every joke when it comes to firepower and survivability. Because who would ever want to ride around in a tank when you could pilot the giant smash bots? Would you want to, Steve? Uh, yeah, I would take a tank. Correct, I would as well. It's criminal that all of these Battletech games need this stuff modded in afterwards. Maybe I want to spin hopelessly in circles in a hovercraft because someone shot out one of my hover screens. Maybe I want to roll the dice in closing the point blank range with my LRM carrier to blast 200 points of hot loaded missiles into a locust. Maybe I want to be that annoying as shit 100 ton tank that will not stop shooting you with four rapid fire auto cannons and LRMs from across the map. Warrior 5, why is this in the game? We, we 
That thing is so annoying, I hate it. And it has so much health. It's got as much health as like a heavy mech. It is a nightmare. We, we are gonna split this topic up into three main parts. Firstly, the history and lore of the tanks and ground vehicles in Battletech, why they're still around and what they're used for, so on, that kind of stuff. Second, what type there are and what they can do. And third, we'll cover a few of the more famous designs. And when I say famous, I mean the ones that I like the most. There might be some overlap, but don't count on it. Let's talk about tanks and why they exist. You want to take a, a wild stab in the dark here, Steve? Uh, be, because they need tanks. Uh, because robots can't do everything. That's incredibly incorrect to the lore, but I'll, well, you know, you know what? what? I'll, I'll, I'll give I'll give you I'll give you half points. You, you get you get half a mark. Congratulations, you're not at zero anymore. They're cheaper than the they, they're cheaper than the others. It's my second oh answer. my god, he gets it in one. We'll edit out the last incorrect answer. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Indeed, that is a huge part of it, and we'll get into that in like a second while I explain. So. You're, you're familiar with the collapse of the Star League, right? The loss of technology and all that? Yeah, it seems a little bit familiar. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a pretty pretty big plot point of the, the actual setting. Well, the bigger and more complicated something was, the harder it was to maintain. The more expensive it was to maintain, and the more likely it was to slowly fade from existence as its numbers were worn down. That's why the vast majority of the really advanced mechs and a lot of the really big mechs, like the Atlas II and stuff, they, they just faded away from the inner sphere completely. And, I mean, a lot of them were stolen by Kerensky when he noped out of there, but that's 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 a completely other issue. Besides the point? Yeah, besides the point. So that's why a lot of mechs from around the Star League era and their technology just disappeared, and the stuff that's left with was the most mass-produced, the cheapest, and the most rugged that managed to survive, and that they managed to, well, spread out enough in the production that somebody couldn't randomly nuke it and completely wipe it out from existence. When it comes to ground vehicles, though, they had a few advantages in this regard even before the collapse. First, they're stupid simple to make compared to mechs. Stompy boys have these weird metallic muscles called Myomer, remember that? They've got the weird neuro yeah, helmets yeah. and the, the... The fibers that hold them all together. Yeah, it, they got the weird the semi-organic weird metal muscle thing. They're, they're creepy. Anyways, tanks do not have all of these complicated things. They got drive shafts and turbines and steering wheels and, and that's, that's basically it. Tanks were far easier to produce, and from a technological standpoint, they were a far more mature industry, meaning the factories, designs, information, and know-how to make them and support them was far wider spread across the inner sphere and less centralized than mechs factories and the like, who generally, when someone invented a new mech, they would zealously guard it, and generally only build it in like one location, and that contributed a huge reason to why mechs got just yeeted out of history because they only built them in one place, and that makes it a target for the sun. Not the sun again. It's, it's making a return. <laughs> this is Battletech. Like, 80% of the fighting ends with a nuke, and the 20% that doesn't has a main character in it. Like, what, what do you want from me? Nuclear weapons might as well be a character by themselves at this point in Battletech. They are, in fact, the main character. So, even before the Succession Wars, tanks and other ground vehicles were far, far cheaper and more widely available than mechs were. It was almost like basic guns are right now in real life. Almost anyone all over the world can get their hands on them, and it's the same thing for ground vehicles and stuff in Battletech. So, you got farmers and miners, small colonies and settlements, just everywhere can get their hands on them. And so, so many pirates and terrorists. The other bonus that they have is raw weight to the firepower difference tanks have compared to mechs. Long story short, treads and wheels are more efficient for carrying very heavy loads. Like the carrier class of missile platform. It's basically a tank chassis that carries hundreds of missiles on top in a giant hot rack. And I'm pretty sure I have an image of it lying around. My favorite part about the carrier, by the way, is that there's like a hundred different versions of it. There's there's no such thing as like a single canon image of it, and every single person can basically interpret it in a different way. Uh, let's see if I get one more good image here to throw at you. Just basically, um, my, my Atlas <laughs> technical is done, by the way. Oh my god, have you been drawing in MS Paint in the background? <laughs> yes. Okay, throw him up there, Sonny Boy. Let's uh, I'm saving let's see it this right now. 
By the way, to the artist that made the Atlas Technical, I apologize. I am so, so sorry for what this man is about to put your glorious work through. <laughs> Bro, it looked amazing. Don't, don't come at me like that. Oh my god! <laughs> There wasn't even an attempt with the arms! You didn't even attempt multiple segments! You didn't even attempt to rotate anything! It's just solid bricks at 90 degrees! Oh! Bro, I told you to have like 700 less lines. Oh my god, no. That's so bad. This is evolving. You spent the effort to model the little gun on the left? That's where you put the majority of your effort? Into that? <laughs> Out of everything you could have committed one of your, like, 15 lines to, you committed, like, five of them to that. Yes. Lord, give me strength, because I do not have enough to deal with this man. Oh, my God. Hey, man, that's not very nice. <laughs> Neither is your drawing, but we have to deal with that. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right. Let's move on from this absolute disaster. Can I delete this? Can I get rid of this message? No. It's part, it's part of our shared DMs. Can I get rid of it? <laughs> no. Oh, okay, then you know what? I'm just, we're going to move on and pretend it doesn't exist, and I'm going to have to suffer later while editing and scrolling through these images. You're going to have to include it <clears throat> in the episode, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, it, it, it's... Yeah, okay, all right. I, I don't think there are many like mechs in the weight class of ground vehicles that can straight up carry the same amount of armaments they do i think a lot of the time mechs have to get, uh, have a lot of sacrifices for their armor and their muscles and a lot of their internals and stuff so ground vehicles generally can load on way more firepower per ton than a mech can of course they can also carry an absolute shitload of armor as well i don't remember the type of super heavy tank but it was 100 tons and it was basically designed to look at enemy, drive at enemy, not die, kill enemy, and it was equipped with a bunch of gigabig cannons, and that was like its only purpose. It could barely move, it was like one of the slowest things in the battlefield, but by god nothing could stop it from moving. The biggest downside is unlike mechs, which can be extremely flexible and quick reacting and hard hitting and like well protected for the most part, ground vehicles pretty much cannot. If it's built like a brick shithouse bristling with guns, then it's as slow as one. If it can sanic speed its way across the battlefield with said hedgehog of bristling guns, then it's probably made of paper. And if it's really fast and well armored, it probably doesn't have any significant arm uh, firepower. The aforementioned carrier with a bajillion missiles has and can repeatedly, from my experience, one-shot smaller mechs with good missile clustering RNG, but it is incredibly slow and it dies if you so much as look at it funny, which is why it mostly only ever engages from long range behind solid cover. So all in all, before the technical technological backslide, tanks were already a highly cost-effective system to deploy almost anywhere for almost any purpose. On frontline battlefields, they would get slaughtered by equivalent mech forces, but as supporting vehicles, they were fantastic. As backline artillery or convoy escort, making up rapid response forces to breakthroughs, or simply serving as a rear guard just in case. And off the battlefield, they would be almost everywhere. Of course, when the Star League fell and the war to end all wars started, followed by the next couple wars to end all wars, technology took a kick in the nuts, along with all the scientists that tried to develop it. The result, however, was that all of the technology needed to maintain, build, and develop mechs began to disappear, resulting in the hundreds of years of stagnation. However, ground vehicles, and especially tanks, were hit far less. In some cases, their weapons had to be scaled down or replaced for simpler versions, because, you know, they couldn't make such high quality or advanced tech anymore, but for the most part, they were left pretty much fine due to a huge reason in their favor. They could mount less advanced engines and technology and perform virtually the same. You see, mechs need a fusion power plant to run. Nothing else can generate the power needed to make the Steppy Boy move. For a long time, tanks also had fusion engines, because why not, they could mass produce them, but for right. the prior mentioned reasons, they were still cheaper. Even when they had the very complicated engines, they, they were still cheaper. 
During the Succession Wars, those fusion engines became far rarer and were desperately needed for mechs instead, and so they swapped out the power plants for older generations. The good old internal combustion engine came back for another glorious hurrah, once again powering the treads of war machines as they rolled over vile protesters across the inner sphere. By dumping the fusion engines, it allowed the vast majority of the cost for normal ground vehicles to be completely slashed off as well without really losing too much effectiveness. The big downside, however, was that any vehicles mounted with a normal combustion engine power plant couldn't operate in space or in non-oxygen atmospheres anymore because they need that for the actual power plant to work. However, considering most of Battletech's fighting tends to happen wherever humans can actually live without spacesuits and stuff, that wasn't too much of an actual downside, and whenever they did need to fight in zero-g, or not, not zero-g, in um, no atmosphere or on like a moon or something, there was plenty of vehicles that did still have fusion engines that could pick up the slack. So this caused the humble tank and hovercraft to even further widen the margin of cost with battle mechs. To put this into perspective, I, I have a comparison between the Scorpion and the Centurion. The Centurion is a 50 ton media mech that is one of the most reliable and rugged workhorses of the Great House militaries. This thing is an absolute classic. It mounts a really, really huge gun in one arm and a bunch of lasers and missiles in the torso. Yes, I, I can see that. Yeah, it, it is a very rugged, very powerful medium mech for its weight. It costs 3.5 million space bucks. The Scorpion is a 25 ton tank, half the weight, equipped with an autocannon 5 equivalent, and some machine guns. It costs 325,000 space bucks. Now let's be clear, a single AC-5 isn't really that scary. The Centurion would like walk all over this tank and not even give a shit. Like, not scary at all. A single medium mech versus 10 of those Scorpions and 10 of those AC-5s would be pulled apart at the seams by the raw weight of fire. It would be shredded by the incoming weight of shells from those 10 autocannons. And so as technology regressed, most standard ground vehicles were either almost unaffected or marginally inconvenienced, while mechs took a colossal hit to everything from the amount of armor they could carry, to the effectiveness of their guns, to the amount of power that they actually had for subsystems and stuff like targeting. The huge difference in numbers and firepower began to grow due to that cost difference. Now, for the most part, you would look at those 10 to 1 odds, and that's pretty consistent across the general classes of mechs and vehicles and stuff for what you would generally see on the battlefield, and assume that mechs would be completely completely phased out because of this, that humanity would go back to the old classics of warfare and leave the advanced high-priced junk. No, we, we could never do that. We love spending money on military stuff. Of course, but you see, our favorite meme of the channel is coming back. Oh Logistics God, plays... Not guy. No. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. I said one thing and you said the other. Now we both look like idiots. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're like 1A and 1B. Pretty much, yeah. So, logistics comes into play full swing here, both for how things are moved around the galaxy and how they're actually deployed onto the battlefield. So, a single mech warrior and the supplies you need to sustain them give you that centurion. Or, you need multiple people in a single crew and across dozens of tanks. That is a lot more people, a lot more supplies, a lot more housing and utilities and creature comforts and everything that you need to keep a force actually ready, motivated, and willing to fight. That seems like a lot of logistics. We, we can't do, be doing that here. Oh, it was an absolute ton of them. There was also a huge transport issue. You see, most dropships which are readily available are relatively small, and they only have slots for four things in them. Now, the dropships don't really care much about the raw tonnage of what they're carrying, like you can load four assault mechs in there, doesn't care at all, but it only has four drop slots. Essentially, each dropship has like a reinforced stabilized bay to safely deliver its combat unit directly into the middle of a battlefield. Each bay can only hold like one thing, like I said, and that gives you the unfortunate choice of loading an atlas in there, or a single tank. Because the really big, like, 100-ton tanks, they're, they're super rare. They're similar to mechs, they, they're not really built much. But it's one thing. 
So most great houses, most forces, but pretty much everyone would be like, I would rather deploy four mechs to fight and control for a landing area, rather than bring four tanks. And then later on, once they've secured a landing zone, then they can bring in the giant bulk transports carrying hundreds of tanks and mechs and all of that kind of stuff. So while ground vehicles can match or exceed the capabilities of mechs by their value, they don't hold the same individual flexibility and moving them around is far more expensive and time consuming. And in order to actually match battle mechs, you need a lot of normal ground vehicles. And for the prior mentioned reason, you can't effectively transport them. And this has left them mostly relegated to garrison forces or as the second wave in a planetary invasion. Wait, you're telling me we had multiple waves in planetary invasions? I thought we just went all in at the beginning of everything. That is how the clans do things. Okay, okay. And with that, that pretty much sums up the history of why tanks and ground vehicles are still around, but why they're not super prevalent all over the place. Let's move on to the different categories of ground vehicles and what they do. We'll, we'll try to cover them a little bit quickly because there's a lot and I'm hungry, I still need to have dinner. So firstly, tanks. Main battle tanks, assault tanks, and fire support tanks. The first type are things like the Scorpion like I showed you. They're reasonably fast, reasonably well armored, and with a decent armaments that has effective tracking and good performance at all ranges. They're cheap and mass produced and can handle almost anything. Well, I mean, they can handle oh. it with enough numbers, with enough numbers. And they tend to carry things like smaller autocannons, maybe a single large laser, or a few supplementary machine guns or small missile racks. Essentially meant to be the generalist with hard-hitting single-shot weapons. They are by far the most common type of ground vehicle you're going to see because they're the most widely useful and the most readily available. There are a lot other, of other specialized types of vehicles, but they're generally not seen as much because, I mean, these kinds of main battle tanks can do most of it well enough, that they are an economic choice. However, if you're looking for something that is really big and really dumb and really hilarious, we have the big boys, the assault tanks. These are essentially the same thing as assault mechs, except on treaded form. There, there are ones that weigh a hundred tons and pack a frankly stupid amount of firepower. I think more than most actual assault mechs on some of them, there's one, uh, let me see if I can find an image of it, cause it is chunky. Ah, perfect. Exactly the, the tank I wanted to see. This is the Demolisher, it's 100 tons. It has two of the biggest auto cannons ever, and they are of the ultra variety. So remember we talked about the King Crab in the video when we said it has like the most giga powerful guns ever in its big pinchers on the front? Yeah. Yeah, these are the same size of guns, except they are of the Ultra variant, which means instead of being single shot and then reloading, they're semi-automatic. You fire them as fast as you pull the trigger, and they have, surprisingly, a relatively low chance of jamming. You can fire them quite a few times before they actually jam for how hilariously big they are. So these kinds of tanks are essentially designed to murder everything in front of them. They are super rare, like I said, and super slow, but they have unbelievably thick armor and incredible firepower to the point where even assault mechs would just die if this thing was rolling down the street at them. They are the ultimate breakthrough tanks. You line them up against static defenses or heavily entrenched enemies and you charge. And you don't stop charging well, until you've broken through or you die. Charging in heavy quotes obviously, but... <laughs> Heavy quotations at the brisk speed of, like... Of a man walking. <laughs> <laughs> of a man walking. And that brings us to the fire support tanks. It is exactly like it says. Things like the Shrek, which is my favorite no, vehicle name. No, not Shrek. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a, we'll, we'll come back to him. But it's got three particle cannons and zaps you from, like, across a continent or the Ithon, which carries a long tom artillery piece, just a colossally big gun, simple and self-explanatory. They kill things from extremely long range. Now, next up, we have wheeled vehicles, and these come in two main varieties. Generally, the first is scout vehicles, and the second is supports, and I'll pull up some images here. So this would be a classic example of a scout tank. 
all the, or a scout tank of a scout vehicle. I have an even better one here, which is literally just a jeep with a laser on the back. There's nothing protecting the pilots. Bro, that's a that's a lunar lander. Come on now. <laughs> it's a little it's buggy. Not a jeep. So the first one, just by their design, is super obvious. They're extremely fast. They carry highly powerful communication arrays and are built to move very quickly and scout things. They also often have on the more advanced ones, stuff like data link. That's not what it's called in Battletech, but basically it lets them lock onto targets and designate things and relate that firing data to artillery or long range missile units, or it can boost the targeting and stuff of nearby friendly mechs and vehicles to basically assist in gunning people down. As for combat, uh, they no, just no. They generally have virtually no armor and in many cases, it's basically like a Humvee or a Jeep that a couple guys are driving around in. They will die the moment anything looks at them, and if they're in a forward scouting position waiting for an enemy advance, they have enough armor to survive long enough that the dude inside can pick up the radio and go, OH GOD THE ENEMY IS- Ugh! and then immediately be cut off as he dies. And then they can figure out where the enemy is attacking from. That's pretty much their purpose on the battlefield. They they, they don't live long. <laughs> they're, they're a pretty uh, live fast, die young, leave a smoldering corpse kind of thing. Uh, so fucking kind of canary thing. in the coal mine moment. Mm. As for the support vehicles, the bigger one, the reason I'm going to call them support vehicles, even though in a lot of cases they have some very heavy weapons on them, is that they are bigger and more robust and carry heavier armor and stuff at the expense of speed, but they're not actually meant for frontline combat. They, they will not survive. There's also things like the coolant truck in this category that can hook up to a mech and circulate extra coolant through it to let us fire as fast as possible without overheating if they're in like a defensive position, or the JES missile carrier, which I've already talked about. It has, it, it basically, it's the same thing as the carrier earlier. It just, it's on wheels this time. Same, same difference. No way. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> They also make up the majority of like anti-air because for some reason in Battletech, missiles are not like a super common anti-air weapon. They mostly just use regular auto cannons and stuff, which is a little confusing, but yeah, it, it, it is what it is. It, they, they do their thing. And then that brings us to Hovercraft. The bane of my existence on tabletop and in the video games. There are two types, worthless trash fodder and Satan coming to eat your rear armor for breakfast. And for anyone who's played tabletop, you understand the distinction. Hovercraft are even more extreme than wheeled vehicles or tanks, but focus more on the actual fighting than they do the raw scouting aspect of it for a reason that I will explain. So this is a really good example of a very small hovercraft. You can see the tiny cockpit and then the very missized missile launcher and laser on the back. And then there is the bane of my existence, my most hated thing of all time, the Savannah Master. And anyone who just heard that name and who knows Tabletop is now clutching their heart as they suffer horrendous palpitations because this thing is awful for every reason you can imagine. That's the reaction. Oh my God, dude, I have, I had a friend, or I still have a friend. It was, it was very tense for a little while there when he, when he hit me with the bullshit. We play tabletop and he, he loves the Savannah Master meme. He's like super into it. And every single time we play a game, it doesn't matter what the points value is. It doesn't matter whether or not he's bringing like clan mechs or whatever, he always, always tries to bring like five or six or seven Savannah Masters. He has 18 of them. I think he lost a couple. I think he used to have 20, but he's, he last I checked, he had 18 of them. This stupid, stupid mech with a single little laser on the front of it. And they are so fast. They are so hard to hit. And every single time he just immediately rushes straight to the other side of the board and it tries to bury all of his hovercraft directly into the back of my most valuable mech. I hate it. It is the most annoying strategy on the planet and you can't hit them. They're so fast. They just fly. The game starts and you are already outflanked. He doesn't, we, like we don't even bother with the first turn. He just forward deploys them on my side of the board. That's what it feels like fighting these things. It's awful. <laughs> It just seems like I'm going to show on your part there. You just need to aim better. I, I'm terrible at making mech builds for tabletop, and I'm not a very good player, so he just he destroys me with them all the time. Hovercraft or my kryptonite. I can't, I, can't, I can't fight them. 
if you ever meet me in real life for like a tournament or something, just bring Hovercraft. It's an automatic win against me. I'll never be able to beat you. So Hovercraft have virtually no armor and they have to because they rely on hover tech and they rely on big jet engines and thrusters and stuff to move around. If they hit that kind of sweet middle ground where they're just a little too big with just a little too much armor, then they're basically useless because you'll still be able to consistently hit them with enough of your armament that you'll kill them super quickly. Even like the most well-armored hovercraft are not actually that armored. They'll, they'll die faster than most of the other stuff in Battletech. They, they are extremely fast and for the most part they're used for harassing tactics. Whereas tanks and wheeled vehicles will generally be more of a maneuver and stand-up kind of force, where they will commit to engagements and then pull back, hovercraft harass the enemy consistently. They will like hang out just outside your range, and then when you get distracted, they'll zip in real quick to poke you a little bit or fire some missiles off, and then when you turn around, they're already fleeing back outside of your range. The, the strategy for a lot of hovercrafts and how they're used in Battletech is to basically keep the enemy engaged at all times. Never give them an opportunity to be out of engagement and always have the potential to pin them down or get a flank or turn around behind them or something. Or, if there are holes opened up in their lines because of a conflict, zip right on through the hole in their defensive line and go straight after their logistics train or their artillery or whatever behind. That's the purpose of the hovercraft and what they do in Battletech. And they are really, really good at that. I hate hovercraft so much. And that brings us to the last little thing. I'm going to talk about a few vehicles that I really enjoy. We talked about the carrier LRM thing earlier. So we are going to talk about the Patton tank and the Shrek. Because I think oh. it's funny. So the Patton tank is, in my opinion, just really cool. And it is almost a community staple. Like, this is one of the more popular tanks in Battletech. There's a lot of art, a lot of people discussing it, a lot of people make fan assets and stuff for it. And it is the classic tank tank. This thing is what you would basically see from the perfect main battle tank. It's got a big main cannon, usually like an AC-10 or something, though there are versions of it that have bigger or smaller guns. It's got a missile launcher on the side of it there. It could have SRMs or LRMs, again, depending on the loadout. And it has a veritable small arsenal of machine guns, flamethrowers, and small lasers, depending on the model, once again, that it uses for anti-light mech or anti-infantry duty. It is relatively maneuverable, relatively hard-hitting, relatively fast for its size. It is just all around great, and it looks a little bit like an Abrams in a lot of the art, so people have fallen in love with it. Moving on from that though, the Shrek, get out of his swamp. Oh my God. <laughs> I love this thing. It is fantastic because it is the definition of stupid sci-fi design. Here is another tabletop version of it. It is, it is just. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Someone was like, we need more firepower. What's our solution? Add more guns. Okay, but how do we do that? Just stretch the turret, make it wider. Just keep adding guns onto it. It has... Did they even actually stretch the turret? Or is that just like... Because it looks kind of like a normal turret. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's just a normal turret. But that's the joke. Because like, it looks so fat. And the thing is, the turret is pretty much empty, like it's almost completely automated because it doesn't have guns, it has energy weapons. Those are particle projector cannons. They fire like a really concentrated beam of like, like super energized particles, right? They do a ton of damage to armor, they scramble your sensors and stuff, and if it hits you with, like it hits you enough times, it can like lock up the electronics of your mech and interfere with its ability to move around. So if you hit someone with like a bunch of PPC shots, you can like cause them to trip if you hit him in the legs or something. And this mm -hmm. thing has no armor. It's made of paper. It just has a bajillion ginormous cannons on it. And it sits like two kilometers away, half buried in a dugout fighting position behind a line of trees with a whole bunch of camo nets on top of it. And it just sits there and it vaporizes you from long range. It, it zaps you from well outside your ability to fight back. Granted, if anything including a stiff breeze gets thrown at it it'll probably explode but that basically concludes the majority of uh everything all the talking points 
I could have made a separate video on each of the different types of vehicles, but for the most part, they all work together in combined arms alongside mechs and infantry and aircraft, because this is a combined arms war game. And yeah, they're really cool. I really like the ground forces. They have some genuinely fantastic designs, and that pretty much concludes the episode. Anything else to say, Steve-O? Uh, thank you to our patrons. Thank you to that guy's name that we can not pronounce for making the outstanding Atlas Technical. Yeah, we actually uh, we actually do have a new patron at the five dollar tier, so another another name to add to the end. Fantastical. I guess adding that little thank you thing at the end works. Woohoo! Boosting the ego of people giving me money incentivizes people to give me more money. Who would have thought? We're living we're living the YouTube life, Steve. <laughs> And with that, we're thank you to all of the patrons supporting Science and Sanity. I appreciate you guys a lot. And a special thank you to the people feeding Steve. David Gabe, Augie, Eleven Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, The Other One, Silencer, Vox Apollyon, Phoenix, and the new guy, BT Legend, which I assume stands for Battletech Legend. There is also an honorable mention to one of our 250 per month tier oh patrons. Spencer, my guy, your profile picture is fucking hilarious. I don't know if you intended for that, but it's really funny. And regardless, general thanks to all of our patrons. You guys are awesome. I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, that's it. I think I think next week we're going to talk about Halo or we're going to talk about spaceships. I can't remember what I had planned because I scrapped the like 10 lines of the script I had written. It was something about spaceships. It was either Halo or it was the space forces of Battletech. One of those two things next week. And with that, the video is over. Outros are hard. Goodbye!